Welcome to Blackboard discussion number three on monopolistic competition. Well, here's the new bit of news. Look at this. A brand new fancy shirt. Why? Well, let's think of our shirt company, A. And here's the diagram facing shirt company A. Quantity, price only. Now I'm just going to draw this demand curve just like that. We're going to just use this demand curve. Let's say this is the demand curve associated with zero economic profits. Well, what's happened is this is the condition when these are the shirts available. And this is not good for shirt company A. They would like a lot more profits. So you know what shirt company A did? Well, you can see right there what it did. It made this new shirt. Fancy, eh? Square buttons, a little yellow collar, some yellow over here on the edge of the sleeves. And with that, we all flock and say, woo, I can't wait to buy that shirt. The demand for shirt company A's shirt shifts to the right. And now we have positive profits, if you can imagine all the cost curves right there. The idea is for this particular model, you can just think of this demand curve shifting back out, and then guess what's going to happen? Perhaps, maybe, these companies are going to say, ooh, I'm going to draw, or I'm going to build that shirt as well. And so we get multiple companies making this kind of shirt, and once again, shirt company A sees its demand curve shifting back to the left. So what does shirt company A do? Well, you got it. It differentiates its product again. So what it's going to do is going to differentiate its product. Perhaps it's going to make a shirt and it's going to really uh, do something fancy now. It's just going to be an all yellow shirt. It goes basic. It's going to be the new trend. And uh, so far, so good it does see some effect to this. In other words, the demand curve did shift back, but now it's going to shift back this way again. Because people do buy, but you know, not as much as shirt company A would like. What could it do? It's developed and designed this brand new yellow shirt here, but it's still not getting as much profit as it would like. Hire somebody from Harvard MBA school. They sit in their office for a week. They scratch their head and they say to themselves, aha! I got an idea. Let's get Brad Pitt to wear this shirt and advertise it. So they make some big posters like this with Brad Pitt on them. He's got a big smile on his face. Let's see, he's got his beautiful hair here coming off, and uh, there's his nose, and there's his neck. And Brad Pitt says, buy this shirt. Or as a matter of fact, he just wears it like this. So there's Brad Pitt wearing his yellow shirt, and now, of course, we all flock to buy this shirt because Brad Pitt is buying it, and the demand curve ultimately ends up over here. So we have product differentiation, and we have advertising, and these are the two key things that monopolistic competition uses to shift its demand curve back and forth. Copycatters shift it that direction. Product differentiation and advertising shifted in that direction. What are they after? They're after profits, of course. So that's kind of the basic dynamics of this monopolistic competition market. What are some of the advantages? Let's turn this off here. What are some of the advantages? Let's see. Advantages. Whoops. Here's one advantage. Oh, well, we get lots of different products. That's good. I get yellow shirts, blue shirts, shirts with buttons, shirts with all sorts of different things. Two, we get advertising. Now, it might seem like advertising isn't a benefit, but you know what happens? Advertising is information. We get lots of good information, like our shirts last longer, or our shirts are waterproof, or our shirts are really cool because Brad Pitt's wear them. So advertising does serve a function. It serves this function of information. So these are just some of the advantages of uh, product different of uh, monopolistic competition. What are some of the disadvantages? These are more kind of classical economic model disadvantages. Things like not producing at minimum average total cost. As a matter of fact, um, a nice thing to think about is that these companies actually have manufacturing plants with excess capacity. Oop, that's a C there. Excess capacity, meaning they're, 
manufacturing is bigger than at minimum average total cost. If you look at these curves and look at the models, you'll see that these companies are always producing something like this, just like monopoly. That's that monopoly inefficiency. What else could be part of the problem? Well, mostly it's not allocative efficient either. So it's not allocative efficient, not in the short run anyway. So you get this kind of same disadvantage as a monopoly, but you get these different advantages. Here's one thing for sure. When you think of monopolistic competition, you think of the real world. I think we're going to end there. I'll talk about oligopoly next time. But the idea is this kind of model starts to feel like the real world. Starts to feel applicable to a lot of different places. Fashion's a good place to go first, but computers, even gas stations sometimes feel like they're in this world of monopolistic competition, differentiating their products, advertising. Consumers get all sorts of different kinds of goods and services, and they get lots of information about them so that they can make their informed choices. That's the idea. That's the model. I think we'll end it there for now. Um, okay. See ya. Thanks for coming.